Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started with our 8 o'clock session. My name is Jordan Warnetsky. I'm here on behalf of the Bismarck NDDOT District. Our topic today is the Beulah Roundabout Retrofit. And our present first, we have two presenters. Our first one is a engineer in our NDDOT design division. And our second is a registered engineer with um, Highlands Engineering in Dickens, North Dakota. Please welcome Monty Dice and Kinsey Robertson. We're on? Yep. Okay, right on. No ACDC and standing ovation, I guess. This is just for Burger. Um, hopefully, we don't talk in circles. <laughs> Roundabouts in circles. Anyways, yep, like um, Jordan said, I'm Monty Dice. I'm a transportation engineer with the DOT Design Division. And this presentation, we're going to discuss retrofitting a roundabout into an existing four-leg intersection. My portion of the presentation will cover the design phase, everything up to project being bid, and then Kenzie's presentation is going to cover everything post-bid. Can you guys hear me all right? Seems like it. The project is located where North Dakota 49 meets North Dakota 200 approximately two miles north of Beulah and seven miles west of Hazen. County Road 21 heads north to Lake Sakakawea here. And prior to the installment of the roundabout, the intersection's existing conditions consisted of a flashing beacon with traffic free flowing from north to south and a stop condition from east to west. A traffic study was conducted with a traffic operations report being signed in 2013 the traffic operations report warranted a new intersection improvement. 13 total crashes were reported, 11 being angled crashes. Of those 11, eight were northbound and eastbound vehicles. Six of these crashes happened during daylight hours with dry conditions. Mercer County requested a roundabout to be investigated. The North Dakota Department of Transportation's scoping team laid out a 160 linear foot retrofit roundabout. The cost estimate during the scoping phase was estimated to be $650,000. A little bit of a timeline here. The scoping report was signed January of 2018 to advance the 160 linear foot retrofit roundabout. The field review was held in May of 2018. Public input meeting to follow was held in August of 2018. At that public input meeting, there was a lot of feedback for the retrofit. Um, the consensus of a lot of the public was they were used to the Kildeer 200 linear foot roundabout. So the cons consensus was to go bigger. Pretty typical. The NEPA document was signed in December of 2018, advancing the 200 linear foot complete reconstruct roundabout after the public feedback. The 200 linear foot roundabout was designed and bid ready in December of 2019. Plans for the 200 linear foot design were bid in February of 2020, where the bids were rejected with the lowest bid being 3.34 million, being higher than anticipated. The design was decided to revert back to the 160 linear foot retrofit with a re field review held in August of 2020. Plans completed were in January of 2021, and the project was sent for bid in March. And it was also, at this point, tied to a mill and overlay project. Okay. That mill and overlay project started east of North Dakota 8, and it tied into the retrofit roundabout. It was approximately 26 miles long, coming in with a bid of 3.49 for that mill and HMA overlay, and then the retrofit came in at approximately 900,000. So where did the 160 linear foot diameter come from? The initial idea was to retrofit using the most existing surface that was out there. With utilizing this footprint, we were assuming cost savings versus a complete reconstruct. The left image here shows the 200 linear foot reconstruct, and it was shifted slightly to the south to accommodate our right of way. And the image on the right is um, what the 160 linear foot retrofit would look like. 
The northeast to southwest quadrants existing surface were approximately 164 linear feet, with the northwest to southeast quadrants being about 160 linear feet, shown in the top middle there. Existing excess surface material outside of our proposed limits were removed to avoid vehicle storage and potential vehicle passing. The traffic combing chicanes, which are the snake-like curve in the road, um, were designed using only pavement markings. The splitter, splitter islands, which would also help with the delineation of traffic, were a raised median to further separate traffic and delineate turning movements. The biggest challenge of this project was to balance the milling versus the amount of asphalt filling. The image in the top right shows the two surfaces intermingled. So the blue surface is the top proposed surface, and the more we pull that out of the presentation, the more widening and filling we'd need, and the more we would push it in, the more milling, and we'd cut into the existing base. So the, the biggest challenge was to balance the amount of filling versus milling. The image in the bottom right represents the profile of the gutter line surrounding the outside of the truck apron. I expected this existing profile to have a lot less grade change than that would have posed a lot less challenge. The roundabout width was designed from the outside, first determining lanes to be an atypical 20 linear feet wide. They were milled and overlaid with asphalt. The truck apron was designed to also be 20 linear feet wide in width and filled with asphalt as well. That left us with a 64 linear feet diameter central island. Without cutting out the center of this intersection and reconstructing, it was determined to fill the central island with asphalt. Oh, sorry. All curb and gutters were designed using a mountable curb and gutter, two feet wide with a two inch difference in height from the gutter line to the back of the curb. The mountable curb and gutters gave the option to keep the entire intersection traversable for all super loads and larger equipment. The concrete splitter islands were to be milled into the existing asphalt surface. After this, the design was to pour proposed concrete to form the raised median splitter islands. The design also used the same concrete, mountable curb and gutter surrounding the perimeter of these splitter islands. Truck blisters were proposed to be constructed four feet wide with eight inches of concrete. The concrete also added a visual contrast for both the splitter islands as well as the truck blisters. All concrete was proposed to be constructed with a faster cure 30 hour ASE mix. In research, we found in the state of Washington had a similar retrofit concept. The Washington roundabout was a smaller scale roundabout that showed issues around the blister areas. The DOT wanted to add the concrete blisters to prevent that asphalt slough crumbling with also adding that color contrast. The image on the right was during construction of our project in the southeast quadrant of the intersection. To accommodate the need for super loads and large equipment to traverse the intersection, we'd used, we did, chose to design with all mountable curb and gutters, like said before. This design would also let us use the retrofit idea for surface drainage rather than reconstructing the central island to, dr to drain beneath the surface. The layout on the screen was just an example of a super load simulation that was sent to us from the code of gasification. The changes occurring to this intersection sparked the need for the intersection to be lit during all phases of construction. The left image shows six luminaires that were added for temporary lighting. The two LED lights closest to the intersection were added to existing poles while the other four were put on temporary poles. Those existing poles were from the existing flashing beacon. The right image shows the proposed 16 LED luminaires. Each quadrant had four lights proposed to help with visibility as well as alert the traveling public of a change up ahead. Phase one traffic control, shown in red, removed the existing excess asphalt and the green slivers added the proposed truck blisters. Phase two was to construct the central portion. During this phase, it was anticipated that each leg operate individually with the concept of driving around an obstacle in the center. The challenge during this phase was to convince the truck traffic to drive around the central island the opposite direction as the traveling public to accommodate the design. This warranted 24 hour flagging. Kenzie will get more into this. 
Phase three was to construct the splitter islands with the intersection operating as a roundabout. Phase four was to mill and overlay the rest of the intersection, finishing the lanes and tying into existing surface. So this project, had, um, there was a lot of traffic, pretty high scale intersection. So our fear was the timeline that was needed to construct it. So we came up with a working day contract to try to avoid, um, try to minimize the amount of traffic that was gonna be impacted. And the total calendar days expected for construction time was 46 days, 35 being working days. Phase one was the removal of the excess existing surface and the truck blister preparation. We estimated this to take about six days. Phase two was estimated at eight days to finish forming, paving, and curing the truck blisters. Phase three laid out for the construction of the central island and truck apron taking approximately seven days. Phase four estimated 11 days to finish the splitter islands with surrounding curb and gutters. Phase five finished out the lanes and remaining finishing items. And now I'll pass it on to Kenzie where you can see how we did. How do we do for timeline and how do we do for design? Uh, thanks, Monty. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kenzie Robertson. I was the construction project manager for this project. Uh, Highlands Engineering was selected to perform the construction engineering. Uh, Mike Ness was the project engineer. Mike Odegaard was the main inspector, and then Mike or uh, Troy Sahovic was the surveyor for Highlands. Uh, this project was administered through the Dickinson District. Uh, as Monty had mentioned, this, was, this roundabout was tied to a uh, 26-mile mill and overlay. Um, there were six bids on the project. Mail construction was the low bid at just over $4.4 million. Um, all six bids were separated by less than $150,000. Um, the roundabout portion alone was just under $910,000. Uh, I think the tied 26-mile mill and overlay was a big uh, interest in this project and help get so many bids. <clears throat> During the pre-construction conference in May, uh, Mayo submitted their original schedule uh, to start construction July 6th and complete paving July 30th. Uh, this would have been 22 working days for the roundabout construction. Uh, they also proposed a few changes. First, they planned to use a class ASE mix to achieve a 30-hour 30 30 hour strength. And they also proposed uh, changing the four traffic control phases into two, just kind of streamlining a couple of those to get um, a little less coordination in between each one. Um, and during that, they would also still do the, the full uh, four phases of construction as in the plans. <clears throat> um, they also proposed eliminating that 24-hour flagging that Monty had mentioned. Uh, this was a concern to both us and the Dickinson District. Um, after the conference, Highlands went back and did our own truck turn analysis and came up with the same conclusion that the design team did, that that left turn uh, couldn't be made without getting on to that gray area that you see on the screen. Um, so it was, the decision was made to still require that 24-hour flagging so that they could stop traffic to allow trucks to turn the opposite way that they should normally travel. Um, everything that was done in this pre-construction conference by mail was essentially just to reduce the number of working days on the project. Uh, mail also proposed utilizing machine control for all of their milling and then also doing all of their milling at the beginning of the project. Uh, this was a concern to both us in the Dickinson district as um, we knew how much work went into balancing the milling and the, um, the paving here. Um, so after the, pro or after the conference, Highlands went back and put together this heat map. Uh, this is comparing the milled surface versus the existing surface. Um, all of this data was provided in the supplemental data, uh, but the contractor didn't have any means to analyze it in-house. Uh, we put this together just for a better visual for them. 
The red area is milling four to five inches, and the blue area would be two and a half to, to four inches. Um, this was a, a big concern after we looked at it. Uh, Highlands went out and cored a couple of these locations and discovered that there was about four to five inches of asphalt uh, under the existing intersection. Once we submitted this back to Mayo, uh, both the core data and this sheet, uh, they changed their plan and agreed that it would be best to wait and mill until just before they were ready to pave. Uh, the mail stated multiple times throughout the project that these heat maps were really helpful in helping them put together a plan of action moving forward. Um, here is the heat map for the paving. This compared the, the final paved surface to that milled surface. Um, the plans called for a three and a half inch overlay minimum. Uh, Mayo had interpreted this as being just a three and a half inch overlay. They thought that they could um, just mill or uh, pave that three and a half inches right on top of the milled surface. Um, that wasn't the case. Uh, this helped them kind of visualize where some of that additional pavement was needed. Um, on this one, the red, if you can't see it, is paving upwards of nine inches. And then the blue would be uh, five to seven inches of pavement. So there's quite a bit of pavement going in a couple of these areas. Um, this, as Monty had mentioned, this project was split into four construction phases. Uh, phase one actually started a week later than they had originally planned, um, <clears throat> just due to their um, scheduling. With the uh, pavement removals and earthwork, both of these were required. Um, there were turn lanes in all four legs of the intersection existing. Um, the roundabout doesn't require that much pavement, so it was reduced. And then all this material was just disposed of off-site. Um, the uh, earthwork was actually started even a week later than this, um, but it didn't end up affecting anything else later in the phases as this wasn't um, critical to this phase uh, since it was all just being hauled off site. The only area on the project that um, needed to be built up were some of these areas right around the radius under the truck blister. And this was built up just using some salvage based material. Um, Knife River was the concrete contractor for all of this, and they utilized. Uh, string line and slip form machines to expedite their schedule as much as possible. <coughs> um, as I mentioned previously, uh, Mayo had hoped to avoid that 24 hour a day flagging. It wasn't until they set drums up along or outside of that uh, outside circle um, and started trying to take their own truck around that they finally agreed that this uh, wasn't feasible. They even installed uh, an asphalt wedge along all four um, radius of the truck blister and they still couldn't make it happen. <coughs> um, another unique item on this project is that it called for milling to the bottom of the curb and gutter. So before anything was paved, um, they came in and milled this and then they were to place the curb and gutter concrete right on top of that milled surface. Uh, this was a concern to the contractor as they were afraid not having that bond breaker in between would cause issues with freeze thaw. Um, it ended up not being a major issue because over half of uh, this area ended up being milled to the bottom of the asphalt anyway. So they still had that gravel underneath. Um, as I mentioned, uh, they utilized the string line and slip form for all the curb and gutter. So they were able to mill, uh, set their string, and pour concrete all in one day. And then they used that ASE mix for the 30 hour cure. So they only ended up having two nights of the 24 hour flagging, so it wasn't a major issue. <coughs> During phase three, uh, they milled the truck apron, the driving lane, and all the asphalt for the splitter islands. Um, as you can see in this picture, the grades are constantly changing. Not only is there a, a vertical curve, a horizontal curve, but there's also uh, constantly varying cross slopes throughout the entire uh, roundabout. 
Um, the contractor originally planned to mill everything um, in one section, and they wanted to do it in a grid pattern, um, but just knowing how uh, this surface was built, uh, it really wouldn't have been feasible. It wasn't until um, IBI arrived on site, they were the milling subcontractor, um, that they agreed to, to mill this radially to kind of keep that grade uh, changing the way it was intended. Um, <coughs> IBI brought on uh, a brand new milling machine for this project, and it was the first time that they had used the machine control with it. Uh, the first night they came out, they had a few issues getting everything set up and uh, calibrated. And then the next morning, they had everything working good, and they were able to mill the entire um, intersection at that point and then pave it later that day. Uh, we went behind them, our surveyors went behind them, I guess, with um, their equipment, and they were tying in within a half inch pretty much everywhere. So that precision milling was was really effective. Uh, and then Mayo paved everything except the top two inches along with phase three. Um, I think the, the ASE mix and then the, um, was really helpful in keeping everything moving along, including on the splitter islands in phase three. Mayo finished paving the top lift of asphalt on July 30th, and that was where they basically ended their phase four of construction. Um, the paving operation is really the only time that they had any real traffic control issues. Um, there's two reasons for this. One, um, just north of this project are a couple mines, and then with the shift changes, there's really the only time where there was real intense traffic. And then also, both days that they paved were on a Friday, and this is a major north-south road from Beulah to Lake Sakakawea. So there's a lot of campers and boats both days that they were paving. Um, after that first day of paving, uh, they or the second day that they paved, they phased it a little differently. Uh, they did it in seven phases to kind of do each quadrant separately to keep the, the traffic moving through as much as possible. It seemed to work much better. Um, I really have to compliment Mayo's management of this project um, and their, uh, not only their personnel, but their subs. Everything really uh, moved along quickly and efficiently. I was very impressed. Uh, they managed to complete from the beginning of the roundabout construction to the end of paving. It was 17 working days, 18 calendar days. Um, they did a, a fantastic job. <clears throat> Some of the miscellaneous items on this project the striping and most of the signs were completed prior to the original um, completion. Uh, these items, or no, yeah, that was before the 45-day working contract. Um, the mill and overlay was also included in that 45-day working contract, and that work was completed on August 11th, so that was also um, just under a month after the roundabout was started. Um, as with so many projects last year, uh, they had issues with their suppliers, both the panel signs and the lights uh, were both later than um, the original contract had included. These items were completion date items, not in the 45-day contract. Uh, they were completed uh, this winter. Uh, a couple other changes, there was some signs that were moved around and then some signs that were added that was completed in January. Uh, in summary, I think there were a few challenges with this project. First of all, the traffic control phasing, um, dealing with those peaks of traffic uh, with the shift changes. Uh, I, I really think that aside from the paving, the traffic was not an issue. I think it was constantly flowing really well. I think the traveling public was happy with it. We had very, very few complaints on the project with traffic control. Um, Without the, that precision milling that I mentioned, I don't know how this project could have been done with a traditional mill. Uh, just with that complex slope and, and trying to mill and pave that, it would have been really, really difficult. Um, another issue is that Mayo um, didn't mobilize for the mill and overlay until about halfway through the roundabout project. Uh, some of those thicker areas of asphalt needed to be filled in. They ended up having to haul 
um, asphalt from another one of their plants a couple hours away to fill in along those truck blisters. Um, and then, as Monty had mentioned, just trying to balance that, the, um, the grades and keep the milling as minimal as possible and not have to put in real thick uh, asphalt was a challenge. All in all, I thought it was a very successful project. I think this could be implemented in other areas so long as um, the geometry of the intersection would allow it. Um, while it isn't as large as uh, that original roundabout that Monty had mentioned, it provides many of the same benefits, uh, probably not the same design life either. That original roundabout was 3.3 million, um, and then this was just under a million dollars. Uh, there's far less impact to the traveling public as it was only a 18 calendar days to complete. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Mayo and all their subcontractors for a very successful project and the DOT for allowing Highlands Engineering uh, the opportunity to work on such a, a unique project. Uh, Monty and I would like to thank everybody for taking the time to allow us to present to you today. Uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions on this project.